Welcome to this STTP Training Center Introductory Seminar, Debunking the Myths of Tongue Thrust, A Clinical Perspective. I am Callie Stone. I will be your presenter today. This seminar has three primary lear learner objectives. Each learner will be able to identify the disconnect between research and clinical practice related to tongue thrust from a speech language pathology perspective. I take that perspective because I have been a speech language pathologist for the past 20 years and I know no other perspective. <laughs> um, that is, I will give that disclaimer as we get going here, but uh, to be fair. The second objective is that you will be able to demonstrate knowledge about tongue thrust, reverse swallow, posterior swallow, and remediation to educate the client regarding the therapy process. When I put this objective in, I couldn't decide if it was too advanced for this course. This, this course is really meant to be an introductory course for the general public, but I believe that as we go through this process, you will be able to know and be familiar with those terms, even though you are not a speech language pathologist, and hopefully we can make it very understandable. We will not go into great detail about um, the phases of the swallow or any specific clinical information. I would um, try to keep it very broad-based, just as I would do if I was sitting across the table from you and you were a client, uh, because I do go through this process educating a client, so um, I do anticipate that it is completely appropriate for um, the general public and will not be too clinical for you to understand. The third thing that you could come away from this seminar understanding is the other team members that might benefit from the tongue thrust elimination process. I am very much an interdisciplinary team clinician and I believe that it's very important for us to address not only our own, our own expertise but to also utilize other healthcare providers and educators as appropriate. So we will um, discuss that as we go about this process as well. So what I've done is divided this uh, seminar into four parts. I guess the main reason for that is organization and the second reason for that is the mind can only uh, absorb what the butt can handle. So um, we've all heard that saying and it's very true. So you can't absorb it and I can't present it effectively in one long uh, presentation. So I will break it up into parts and you can either, when you see a screen that looks like this and has a title, you can either pause and um, go back into it or I may actually edit and, and divide it up into four separate modules. So we'll see how it comes together. But do know that this title screen, so to speak, we'll break it into the four parts that we're gonna cover. The first, obviously, is the perspectives in tongue thrust. The second part will be the clinical dilemmas. The third part will be the clinical solutions. And then finally, part four will be that interdisciplinary professional um, collaboration that I spoke of a minute ago. So this is where I uh, feel obligated to give you my background and perspective. You need to know that I come at this, like I had mentioned earlier, from a very SLP perspective, a very clinical perspective. Uh, I started out in a hospital outpatient setting, and at that time, I was the only SLP in this pretty large hospital setting. And if you were, uh, they, they self-insured. So if you were an employee of that hospital, then, and you needed rehab, then you would come to this outpatient rehab setting that I worked for. And so what happened, uh, my background was actually in traumatic brain injury, neuro disorders. I worked with a lot of brain related issues. And when the brain is compromised, people have um, swallowing problems, they have um, thinking and organization problems. So this was kind of my focus clinically, but because we were in this outpatient setting, I would receive these referrals for tongue thrust. And you have to understand uh, the, the clinical scope of a speech language pathologist is very vast. And um, I had that underlying foundation, but I hadn't, I hadn't really focused on the tongue thrust specifically. And even articulation was not my favorite because I really liked the more complex neuro patients. So I would get these tongue thrust patients and um, it happened a couple of times and I didn't 
you know, my thought was, oh my gosh, what do I do with these patients? And so I reached out to other providers in the community that I knew had mentored me when I was in college and that they, I knew because of that relationship that they had expertise in tongue thrust or at least experience in tongue thrust. And so um, I reached out to them. Um, I also reached out to the research and to our national organization to collaborate and find out what's going on in the research, what's going on clinically, how do I best serve these, this clientele. And what I was told at that time was that, and, and do I have it in here? Um, I don't have it in here. But this time was probably about 1999-2000. And so uh, we're looking now, it's almost 16 years ago, or it is 16 years ago. So basically what I was told was these individuals need to have basically articulation therapy. You teach them where to put their tongue. You do uh, some exercises. It takes a year and then they will need rechecks. So it, very, it was very much uh, an articulation, a placement, a behavioral approach. And my clinical background was, like I said, with dysphagia and apraxia. And so I looked at how um, the muscles worked and realized that these patients had many characteristics in similarity to my neuro patients. Now I'm not saying <laughs> that they have any type of brain injury, but the muscles um, were working very similar to those who had swallowing problems as opposed to um, articulation problems. And I think that was key um, because I started kind of playing around implementing some of those dysphagia um, strategies that were really effective with my patients and found that they were also effective with my tongue thrust patients. And so as my clinical practice with this population increased, uh, there's a phenomenon that happens. Once you're good with something, people come to you more. <laughs> so the word gets out and people tell their friends or the referral sources, they're saying, you know, who does tongue thrust? Oh, well, I heard Kelly Stone does uh, a really good job with it. And so I just kind of naturally organically started getting a lot of these kinds of patients. And what's interesting is that they, they were not articulation patients. They were not sick patients. They were healthy teenagers coming from orthodontists. That's where they came from. So it wasn't because of the tongue thrust that I had a private practice, but I, I did open a private practice in 2003. And one of our areas of service, because like I said, we got this, this influx of tongue thrust because we were having really good outcomes. And as a private practitioner, um, really good outcomes lead to really good referral sources. And so I had people saying to me, you need to um, put this together in, in a protocol in a way that it can be replicated. Uh, long story short, it actually became um, a niche in that private practice and is something that I have retained even though I have um, long since sold the practice, I have retained um, my intellectual rights and my copyright to what is now known as the Stone Tongue Thrust Protocol. Um, I actually began training it um, as a protocol in 2004 um, it, within, my clinic, within my clinic and with the clinicians who were employed there. And um, in 2013, no, 2014, began a certification process for practitioners who um, want to be able to teach in a very effective way the, um, the tongue press protocol. So to back up a little bit, instead of um, taking a year and retuning, nobody takes that much time. Nobody is going to be that committed to a program. It's just too frustrating. And um, I believe that that is part of the reason that we get into this area of controversy. Um, what happened was uh, along that same time, we also had a lot of healthcare reform going on, not the healthcare reform we have now, it's what we call the first Medicare Reform Act, um, 1996 to about 2001. Um, we have the second one that we're in the middle of now. But basically what happened was, uh, you know, nobody wants to, it's really rare that you find a client who is so committed to um, the therapy process that they're gonna come to therapy twice a week for a year and then come back for tune-ups. 
Um, we all just don't have that kind of attention span, that kind of time, that kind of money, the resources. I had to be more efficient. My, my environment just did not allow for that kind of timing. And so we did become efficient and um, clinically were able to get to a point where our clinical data, on average, um, it's about 10 sessions, seven to 10 sessions for the average um, client. And there is no regression. And I really believe that's because of the way um, we come at it from a very different perspective, looking at the muscles and the underlying mechanism rather than um, just a behavioral change, which is really hard to do if you haven't addressed the underlying cause. So that's where I come from. I come from this perspective of a very frustrated clinician. Um, that's what we're going to talk about today. And then because of that, um, coming up with a very effective tried and true method that has now had uh, made it what I hope to be a real impact. And when I do follow up with my patients and have done um, follow-up research, we've got as far as five years out. And um, I've not had anyone who actually completed the program and uh, eliminated their tongue thrust actually regress and go back to that previous pattern. I don't have a problem saying it's effective, it's efficient, and um, I really want to educate the public and the professionals to be able to carry um, it forward and make a difference. So what's the big deal? Why was it that I had such a hard time getting the information about tongue thrust? It was just this um, controversy that has been going on in our profession for many years, probably since about the 50s to the 70s. Um, we have a fairly, I still think of it as a fairly young profession if you compare it to something like nursing. It's very much rooted in um, the education side of things, education, articulation, language. Coming later down the pike was the medical and um, it brought in the neuro, like I was talking about, the loss of language, the loss of speech after something like a stroke or a brain injury. And then um, swallowing has been our last piece to come in. Dysphagia is a, the term we use. You'll hear it, dysphagia, dysphagia, it's the same thing. You can see here on your screen how it's spelled. As a layperson, I don't know that um, it makes that big of a difference. Just know it's a swallowing disorder. For this um, seminar, I will refer to it quite a bit. Um, I will refer to it as swallowing disorders, and we'll talk about different kinds of swallowing, uh, because in my opinion, tongue thrust is a swallowing disorder. So you have these, what is OMD? OMD is an oromyofacial disorder, super scary sounding. Um, basically, it is any structural abnormality of the oral, facial, or mechanism. So um, it includes things like cleft palate, um, it includes facial abnormalities, um, and it also includes tongue thrust. So again, historically, tongue thrust was addressed by OMD, and OMD was very much a small specialization within the profession of speech language pathology. Um, it requires a lot, and it still does, requires a lot of specialization, a lot of continuing education, and um, it's quite expensive. And so as a practicing clinician, in a hospital setting, or well, an outpatient setting, I didn't have time to get that specialized training with OMD. It, it just didn't interest me. That was not my area of, of interest. Dysphagia was an area that I had a lot of um, experience in and was really starting to refine uh, in our profession. So we were starting to get a lot more research. We were starting to get a lot more treatment techniques. We were starting to, to get more effective and efficient in our dysphagia treatment. And then finally, articulation. Like I said, articulation has been around a long time. It's kind of where it all started and it had its hold on tongue thrust, but it was really from an articulation perspective, meaning how a word is pronounced. So if someone has what would be in the public, a lot of times they'll call it a lisp, so they're talking on the front of their teeth. Uh, and you can hear, so it might sound like this when someone has a frontal lip, when their articulation is not precise. Um, you may also have the Waja Wabbit R articulation errors. The, the 
L, R, and S tend to be the hallmark articulation deficits of somebody who is, is demonstrating a tongue thrust. So again, you hear it, you see it, they treat it from an articulation perspective. This is where you put your tongue. This is where you hold it in a resting posture. That's supposed to eliminate the tongue thrust. Well, it didn't. So we have this controversy of who, who is it that does tongue thrust? There's this little teeny tiny part in the middle there where it all kind of overlaps. And I've yet to meet a person who really fits in that middle piece effectively. Um, I think we all tend to have one or another camp. But because of this division and because of this um, evolution of our profession, we have this disjointed, incomplete research and toolbox, if you will, to choose from. So you'll even hear people say, there's no such thing as tongue thrust. Hear people say, oh yeah, I had therapy for it and it didn't work. You might hear, oh, my orthodontist told me to put my tongue up on the roof of my mouth and breathe with my mouth closed. Uh, you also might have an orthodontist who said, who um, puts in um, different appliances to try to teach the tongue to sit in a different place to eliminate the tongue thrust. So there's just a lot of controversy in tongue thrust, particularly in speech language pathology. I think that gives a lot of the reason why we have lack of research, if you will. Then, as I just was uh, alluding to, you also have a controversy of tongue thrust across disciplines. Whose scope of practice is it? I mentioned to you that historically it's been um, children in school who have articulation difficulties, and so they're being treated by an SLP in the schools who has expertise in articulation. Um, you also have those oral myologists who are specialists with the OMD, and they work um, primarily with OMD, and those are often syndromes and, um, and severe medical disorders. And then you have uh, the dental and orthodontic. And these are the clients that came to me, the ones who were typically in orthodontic care. They either um, were in the beginning phases or they had their, dent their uh, braces on or they had them taken off and they were headed back for their second or third pair of braces when the orthodontic, the orthodontist, sorry, and the parents say, oh, hold on, there's something else going on here because the orthodontia is not sticky. So those are um, all of those disciplines um, cover the scope of practice because they all specialize in that oral area. So what does the current research say? What I was referring to earlier was, um, you know, 1999, 2000-ish and um, when this was all kind of evolving and um, and my clinical growth actually occurring. So now, roughly 15 years later, um, we are seeing an increase in evidence in the literature that tongue thrust does exist, uh, although it's still very controversial how to define it. As a result, I've made my own definition based on the hundreds of patients that I've now treated for tongue thrust effectively. So I do consider myself an expert and a specialist in tongue thrust and, and have defined it uh, in for the tongue thrust protocol. And I'll give you that definition here in a moment um, because we still have people fighting about it in the, at, at the university levels, the research levels. The other consistent information coming from the research is that we really don't know what causes tongue thrust. Um, it, you can't say, you know, A causes B. There are definitely some common characteristics. There definitely are commonalities, but they cannot be linked as a direct cause and effect. And again, we'll talk about that as we go through this today. And then finally, um, there is increasing evidence 
that tongue thrust is in fact an oral phase dysphagia. This of course to me is really exciting because there's nothing better than having research validation for what we've been doing clinically. Um, and that's oftentimes how it works in the, the field. We find our clinical judgment, uh, our clinical skills develop based on um, the needs of our clients. And so we develop hunches and theories and um, practice. And then we try to uh, research them and back them up and determine if they're legitimate or not. So it's very exciting to me. I've actually worked for the last seven years at our local university and the research coming out uh, by Dr. Tony Cycle about um, oral phase dysphagia being a potential risk factor for oropharyngeal dysphagia is really exciting. I've included the references um, at the back of this lecture, um, but again, for this the, the research is there for your information if you um, want to follow up on it, but certainly at this seminar level, um, I don't anticipate you understanding all of the nuances of the swallow and, and um, all of those information. What I really think the important takeaway is that we are starting to see evidence that in fact, um, tongue thrust can be um, a risk factor for further swallowing problems as a person um, ages, and um, that's significant as we will talk about preventative care. Again, um, I throw this in here just because I feel obligated to as a responsible practitioner. <clears throat> it may be a bit clinical for a, a general introduction seminar, but I am keeping it in here because I think we are becoming a more savvy and uh, I hope responsible patients understanding and asking questions about our healthcare and what's being done to us and with us and for us. So uh, that's basically evidence-based practices that we actually have a foundation, um, a research base, uh, information that is valid and reliable and that we're not just willy-nilly practicing. So even though the Stone Tongue Thrust Protocol was developed in the clinical realm, it was based on well-founded and broadly understood swallowing practice. So it was, as often happens, we use something that works in one realm in another realm that is related. So basically what's happened is while all this deliberating about whether it exists and what to call it and who should treat it, how to treat it and how to prove it is going on, it's creating this really frustrating cycle for the therapist to be in. Uh, because we're being told, well, there isn't good evidence about it. While we're waiting for this research to happen, patients are still needing help. And so that's, that's what happened. That was the dilemma I was in, where we had um, patients who were coming to me, but we didn't have really great resources or research to back it up. The clinical effectiveness is what we've had to rely on. I'm, I'm fortunate that I had those people around me. I'm fortunate that I saw those trends happening and that I took that clinical data and that I thought, you know what, let's, let's follow up with these guys. Let's track them. Let's see what's going on because this is not what's happening with most people in this profession. This is not the outcomes that they're experiencing and um, it's not the timeline that it's typically taking. And so we did that clinically demonstrating that it wasn't a fluke and that it wasn't um, a wild hair, but it was actually clinically based practice. And now hopefully we've gotten enough people to listen and we've got enough um, information going on at the university level with that OMD and OPD um, correlation that we can now begin um, standardizing it and proving it in a more sterilized laboratory recognized way. But again, for the general public, who cares? It works um, and let's get it out there and, and make it happen and let all of the, the hashing out happen um, where it needs to happen. So I took the liberty of defining my own tongue thrust. <laughs> so here it is. Tongue thrust is the forward depressed placement of the tongue at rest, which may or may not protrude through open lips, but often protrudes through open teeth. 
The tongue thrust is exhibited during a reverse swallow. So that's a technical definition because it comes out of the actual protocol itself, um, which is meant not for the public, but for um, clinical practitioners and not all clinical practitioners, but those who have chosen to take the, the additional training and education to, to learn the philosophies and, and the procedures behind it. So basically what that means in layman's terms is that the tongue is sitting on the floor of the mouth and typically, so depressed placement means down on the floor of the mouth at rest. And sometimes um, you may see it, it may actually protrude past the teeth and past the lips. And other times it is just protruding through the teeth, but maybe not the, the lips. You often see the open mouth posture. If for just a second, as you're listening to me, if you mess with your own posture, think about where your tongue is right now. As you're listening to this lecture, is it floating, nearly touching the roof of your mouth, behind your top teeth? Or is it laying on the floor of your mouth, on top of your teeth, or in front of your teeth? The tongue thrust, in order to be classified a tongue thrust, it's also um, exhibited during a reverse swallow. In a reverse swallow, when a person swallows, the tongue moves up onto the roof of the mouth and pushes back the food, what we call the bolus. So it goes up against the roof of the mouth and squeezes and pushes down into your throat and then down into your esophagus and into your stomach. Okay. Again, we're not going to get into all of the um, extreme detail of this, but I also will put up a a visual of the phases of the swallow into the, the course so that you can look and see um, the cross section, what that looks like. But I think it's most effective to think about what it feels like. So that's why it's not here. I want you to actually think about it. So if you swallow your spit for a second, you push it, kind of collect it all together. You push up against the roof of your mouth and it squeezes back down the back. In a posterior swallow, You'll hear me say posterior swallow, normal swallow. Um, that's the that's what's happening up and back. So posterior meaning it's moving up and back. Okay, with a reverse swallow or a tongue thrust swallow, the person is pushing it forward. So if you are a tongue thruster yourself, and usually when I'm teaching this in a class of probably 50 people, um, I have on average mm, five of them. So about 10% um, will come up to me after class and say, I think I have a tongue. Instead of going up and back, it actually pushes forward and kind of flips the tip of the tongue, flips the bolus back, and it kind of catches in the back and swallows. So instead of it being this smooth up and back squeezing motion, it's a forward flip catch it motion. Okay? So the tongue thrust. For the definition, in my opinion, of tongue thrust, you have not only that forward depressed resting posture, but when the tongue is active, you've got that reverse swallow that's pushing forward and flipping back. Notice that in my definition, I don't have a single thing about what the tongue is doing during articulation. We all move our tongue forward in articulation. When you make the TH sound, uh, your tongue is on your teeth. There really is no time that it's beyond that. Again, my experience, the patients that I was treating, yes, absolutely, there are tongue thrusters who have articulation disorders, absolutely. But the patients who are coming to me were just showing that reverse swallow as their primary and their resting posture as their primary diagnosis. So I've seen lots and lots of people who've had a tongue thrust and no articulation compromise whatsoever. And so that's why I leave it off because I don't believe you have to have an articulation impairment in order to have a tongue thrust. I just don't. Here are some pictures of that tongue thrust. Okay. Um, and I could just show you so many. <laughs> they all look 
different. And I think that is also um, a misnomer. It's uh, one of the things that is misunderstood. People think that a tongue thrust, you have to see it. They have buck teeth, um, AKA an overbite, this tongue that's hanging out all the time and articulation errors. And as you can see from these pictures, that's just not the case. In fact, if they closed the lips on probably this picture here in the middle and this picture down here on the right, if, if those lips were closed in those two mouths, I don't believe they would be diagnosed with tongue thrust using the traditional because this one here on the top is the only one of these three that meets the traditional tongue thrusting criteria. So these are the ones that the orthodontist would send for therapy if they even felt like it was worthy of therapy. But these and these, they would just try to remediate with um, orthodontia. But then when the tongue keeps doing what the tongue does, this open bite here, or these lateral edges that are not coming up because there's a tongue sitting in the way. They're gonna go back. All right, I'm going to pause here uh, because I think this is a great place for us to stop. You have my bias now. You understand where the speech language pathology perspective comes from in tongue thrust and maybe a little bit more about the swallow and how it relates to tongue thrust. So we'll move on to clinical dilemmas, but this is a good time for you to pause 